so let's see. Yeah, just like we practice, it's just going. Uh, All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. Uh, we will be starting here in about uh, 30. Well, it is 1230, so we're starting right now. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Virgil Moorhead, Jr. I'm uh, part of the, the Big Lagoon Rancheria, which is Yurok and Talawa. And I'm also the Behavioral Health Director here at Two Feathers Native American Family Services. Two Feathers, for those of you that are tuning in for the first time on our speaker series, is located in Humboldt County, which is in Northern California, about five hours north of San Francisco, right on the beautiful Pacific Ocean. Uh, before I introduce our, uh, my colleague Shoshone and our guest today, uh, I wanted to pay uh, respect and uh, really uh, honor the, the land that we're currently on, or I'm currently on, which is in McKinleyville, which is the Weot people. And I also want to say that an agency, Two Feathers, we stand in solidarity with those that are, that are struggling and fighting for social justice and equity in this uh, country. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my uh, wonderful colleague, Shoshone, and she's gonna introduce herself. And then uh, I'll provide a brief uh, uh, bio of our guest today, uh, Dr. Elliot Groves. Shoshone? Thanks, Virgil. Hi, Ayiqui, uh, Naknao Shoshone. Hi, my name is Shoshone. I'm a Yurok uh, tribal member, uh, Talwa, Karuk, Chukko, Rogue River descent. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, on this interview today. I am currently a mental health therapist for Two Feathers, um, working in their um, Checks for, uh, for Hope program and suicide prevention, providing direct services. So it's just a pleasure to be here on this interview today with Dr. Elliot Groves. Thank you, Shoshone. And yes, and so, you know, this is part of our speaker series and really it's a, a training on uh, suicide prevention and uh, from an a indigenous perspective uh, and, you know, no better than uh, Dr. Emma Elliott Groves to uh, speak on this uh, sub this very important uh, topic and issue in many of our indigenous communities. Uh, Dr. Elliott Groves is a, an assistant professor in the College of Education at the University of Washington. She holds a PhD in education psychology and a master's of social work in children, youth, and families. Much of her research centers on understanding the meaning and explanation explanations of suicidal behavior from the perspective of indigenous people, including in her own community, uh, Kauchitin. Uh, hopefully I got that right, uh, but I was practicing, but I don't think I did. But anyhow, uh, Dr. Uh, Elliot Groves, welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. Again, my name is Emma Elliot Groves, and I'm Kauachin Tribes from Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and I'm very honored to be here with you and I'm honored to be calling in from the traditional territory of the Duwamish people here in Seattle, Washington. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share the screen here and make sure that we are ready to go. So uh, thumbs up, are we still good? Yes, we are good. Thank you, everyone. Um, so today, again, I'm calling in from the Duwamish Territory in Seattle, Washington, and I'm giving a talk today, Restoring Indigenous Relationality, Our Hope for Tomorrow. So I'm from Cowichan Tribes on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. My great grandparents were Abraham and Ellen Johnny, Charlie Rice and Hilda Wesley Bob. Joseph Peters and Mary Jane Wise, and John and Emma Elliott. My dad on the top left was Gordon Elliott. In his time here on earth, he was a traditional fishing rights activist, and he, along with others, had built a traditional fishing weir across the Cowichan River in opposition to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, who said that we couldn't 
fish for food. Um, my mom on, in the middle is, uh, her name is Della Rice Sylvester, and she's a traditional medicine person who's been studying plants as medicine all her life. Hey, Dr. Uh, Elliot Groves, I, I think uh, it's still on the uh, original slide. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm not sure what happened there, but can you see those photos? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So my mom here is on the top, or is in the middle, and her name is Della Sylvester. She has been studying and learning plants as medicine all her life from her aunties and her grandmothers. On the top right is my husband, Michael, and my two children, Caspian and Story. These three are some of my biggest reasons for being. And on the bottom, I share a photo of my 40 closest friends and family who attended our wedding. I share these photos with you to give you a glimpse about who I am um, through my relationships and to give you an understanding about how I came to be here. I share these stories to help you understand that the role of cultural practice and systems of relationality have always been a significant part of my life. So one of the responsibilities that we have as indigenous people to our relationships is to share what we know. I'm Cowichan, and in Coast Salish tradition, a large part of sharing what we know is preserved through the witnessing process. We call witnesses to be keepers of our history and to share with others what they've observed. We do this in part because our traditions are oral, but also in recognition of the work that's taken place during our time here together. The stories that I'm going to share with you are stories of my own or stories that have been shared with me. I give thanks to those who have shared their stories with me because without them, I wouldn't be here. I also give thanks to each and every one of you for joining the call today as story listeners. I would like to ask each one of you to bear witness to the stories that are shared, to store and care, to care for these stories, and most importantly, to share the knowledge with others. Sorry, I'm having a, it's not moving to the next slide, thank you. Um, so what I plan on doing today is to share a story with you about how I got into this research. Then I will give you a broad overview of indigenous suicide, followed by a research study that we conducted with Cowichan tribes on Vancouver Island. From that research study, I wanna share stories with you or teachings that other folks had shared with me. And through these stories, we'll come to understand approaches and uh, approaches to helping address suicide in our communities. And then finally, we will finish with suggestions for everyday practice. So in the spring of 2012, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do my doctoral research on, my sister Sabrina called me. And now she doesn't usually call me, she usually Facebook messages me. So I knew that something was up. She called me to tell me that her friend's partner had died by suicide, leaving behind young children. She told me that whenever she saw her friend, she didn't know what to say to her. She didn't know how to support her. She felt like she was walking on eggshells around her. I could hear her rushing around, gathering things that she knew her friend would need. Blankets, pouches, kerchiefs, fish, water. She knew that the family would need certain things immediately. She knew that it's our job as community members to hold up the family during their greatest time of need. Sabrina and my brother Troy are cultural knowledge keepers and they carry our cultural teachings about how to support others when someone passes away. They know that one of our biggest jobs during a loss in our community is to be there for the family, to be present and to help in whatever way we can. They know that trauma heals in the presence of caring others. But a death by suicide seemed different Sabrina asked me if I knew our cultural stories about suicide. I didn't. She asked me if I knew how to support her friend during her time of need, and I was too afraid to make any suggestions. After this conversation, I called the Cowichan Tribe's chief and council and found out that they had placed our entire community under a local state of emergency. The loss that my sister had experienced was the seventh death by suicide on Vancouver Island in that short time period. And as a researcher, I knew that the very first step in addressing any problem was to understand from the perspective of community members what is going on here. So this became my doctoral work. I interviewed elders, young people, other community members, and professional caregivers to understand their explanations for suicide in our community. 
Mm. Oops. So I'm trying to go to the next slide and it seems to be frozen. So let me just, oops, there we go. So now I'll give you an overview of um, suicide among indigenous populations, and then we can go into the actual research study itself. So around the world, each year, we, lo we lose approximately 800,000 people to death by suicide. However, suicide doesn't impact all racial and ethnic populations equally. Suicide impacts American Indians and Alaska Natives in the United States, First Nations, Inuit and Métis people in Canada, Aboriginal people of Australia, and indigenous Maori of Aotearoa at disparately high rates in comparison to the national averages. For example, among First Nations people in Canada, First Nations young people between the ages of 15 and 24 are particularly at risk. First Nations male have a suicide rate of 126 per 100,000 in contrast to 24 per 100,000. And you can see First Nations females in the same age group have a suicide rate of 35 per 100,000 in contrast to five per 100,000 of non-Aboriginal, um, the non-Aboriginal population. Here in the United States, you can see that um, the suicide rate by age, broken down by age for American Indian and Alaska Native people is in yellow and the national average is in green. We can see here that American Indians and Alaska Natives in the United States die by suicide at a younger age in contrast to the national average. Um, this, uh, this makes me think that perhaps it has something to do with the greater respect and cultural tradition that we have for caring and honoring our elders in contrast to for example, the non-Hispanic population, the, the folks who are at highest risk in the non-Hispanic white population are between the middle-aged men between the ages of about 45 and 54, as well as elder white men who are older than 85. So these patterns are different. And what we wanna think about today is why are these patterns different and how are they impacting our um, elders or young people? And so the research question that we have that we brought to the community is, what are the explanations for suicidal behavior in Cowichan from the perspective of community members? Oops. So the Cowichan tribes, just to give you an idea of the context, is located on the southern tip of Vancouver Island, British Columbia, with approximately 4,900 or more members, the uh, Cowichan tribes is and has always been the largest First Nations community in British Columbia. Prior to European contact, Cowichan Tribes was a traditional food gathering society, which meant that our everyday um, practices were centered on a collective activity that focused on our own, that focused on planning and preparing for our futures. But the Indian Act of 1876 in Canada um, has had detrimental impacts on Cowichan tribes. For example, um, the Indian Act defines and racializes Indian identity. It supported the removal of Indian children from our family homes. It altered gender relations and it mandated the removal and sedentarization through the reservation system. So to answer the question, what are the reasons for suicide in the community, we conducted 21 semi-structured interviews with professional caregivers, young people, other community members, and elders. And the goal of each interview was to understand their individual everyday experiences, their um, beliefs and their perceptions related to death by suicide, and suggestions for community specific solutions. Once we um, conducted these interviews, we then transcribed each interview and coded them first through grounded theory. And this was just an initial reading to find out what kinds of information was emerging from the data itself. But then we sorted the reasons for suicide into two different buckets, um, individual level explanations, which we theorized using the interpersonal theory of suicide, as well as collective level or interdependent level uh, explanations for suicide. And we theorized that through settler colonial theory. So first, um, I will give you 
a little bit of background about the interpersonal theory of suicide, which helps us understand individual level factors, followed by some examples in the data. And then I will go into settler colonial theory, followed by some examples in the data. So the interpersonal theory of suicide is a theory about why people die by suicide. You can see here in the middle that the desire for suicide or the wish to die by suicide occurs in the context of both thwarted belongingness and perceived burdensomeness. Thwarted belongingness is this idea that I'm so alone and I don't have anyone to turn to. This concept of construct of thwarted belongingness is predicated on the human fundamental need to belong. And you can imagine that somebody might begin to feel alone or that they or lonely or that they don't belong through things such as a divorce, child removal, the loss of someone close to them or social isolation, things that we're all experiencing right now. On the right hand side, you see perceived burdensomeness. This is predicated on the fundamental human need for purpose. So people, when they begin to feel like they're a burden on their loved ones or even a burden on the world or that their family might be better off without them, that's this idea um, that's based on feelings of liability and lack of purpose. And you can imagine that people experience that during things such as uh, chronic unemployment, when they actually want to be employed, chronic illness, or incarceration. So when those two things happen at the same time, that's when the ideas or the desire for suicide begins to emerge. But not all people who think about or wish to die by suicide actually do. And in fact, most people don't, which is the good news for us. Um, we, the difference, though, is this acquired capability to enact lethal self harm which is predicated on a fundamental human self-preservation. So if you imagine, for example, that you're walking down the street and you slip on a banana peel, you automatically have this, um, this self-preservation mechanism that would go to make you want to protect yourself. The same is true for um, enacting lethal self-harm. It, it, it isn't easy. So the difference between that um, acquired capability is this idea of exposure and repeated exposure to physical uh, violence or sexual assault. So you can imagine that somebody who has who is a war veteran might have that repeated exposure. Somebody who is chronically ill might be in and out of hospitals and have that type of exposure, um, who has experienced repeated physical or sexual assault, um, or even repeated suicide attempts. And when all of these things sort of coalesce at the same time, that in the very middle where the red asterisk is, is when people begin to be at serious risk for uh, serious suicidal behavior. So to give you an example of what we found in our data, we can take a look at um, this chart here. Across the bottom, you see uh, acquired capability, perceived burdensomeness, and thwarted belongingness. Um, we've divided that up. Um, for example, under acquired capability, we counted the history of violence. So when participants mentioned violence, when participants mentioned suicidal behavior, we counted the times that people talked about themselves or others as a liability um, or self-hate. And also in terms of belongingness, we looked at absence of reciprocal caring relationships or feelings of loneliness. And here out of 21 interviews, you can see that 20 out of 21 people, for example, identified suicidal behavior of either themselves or a close loved one. Um, similarly, 19 out of 21 people talked about history of violence, as well as an absence of reciprocal caring relationships. So to give you one example, we turn to Jake. Jake at the time of the interview was 23 years old and following several confrontations, including a physical conflict with his younger brothers, Jake's single mother became really concerned about his behavior. She felt like he needed a positive male influence in his life. So he gave him the opportunity or option to move out of the province to be with his grandmother and that side of his family, or to move to Cowich and to be with his father. Um, father's side of the family. And Jake has always wanted his father to be a part of his life. However, his father struggles from substance use disorder. Um, so Jake moved to Cowichan to be with his dad, hoping to spend time with his, hoping to spend time with his dad. And Jake had, had described to me his feelings of suicidal ideation and thought. When I asked him to tell me about that, he said, I always wanted my dad to stick around. He never would. That's when my thoughts were coming in, when I was feeling alone like that. 
There were a few times when I was just right there at that low, lonely moment. I wished for my dad, and I thought my dad was coming for me. After my mom couldn't turn me into a man, I felt so alone because I didn't know my family that I was living with at the time. So if you imagine moving to a town to be with family that you don't really know um, and to live on their couches and to surf from one auntie's couch to the next, you can imagine how lonely Jake felt. You can imagine how much of a burden he must have felt on his family. And for him, that's he describes it as that low, lonely moment. And for him, he's he's particularly describing that feeling of thwarted belongingness. But you can see here in the red that I've coded um, some of the language that he was using as different parts of the interpersonal theory of suicide. So now we can go ahead and turn to settler colonial theory and to think about what folks, what kinds of explanations for suicide folks were giving that might be considered on a collective level. So settler colonialism, um, we engage settler colonialism because this work took place in Canada and Canada is a settler colonial state. I think that um, it's necessary to center our indigenous experiences in relation to historical, cultural, social and political contexts. At its core, settler colonialism is about uh, settler acquisition of indigenous land. Settlers are interested in coming to take over our territory um, in order to build their own um, homelands, in order to establish roots on indigenous territory. But in this particular process, the land ownership and sovereignty always remain with the colonial power through a variety of um, different uh, through a variety of different kind of concepts and theories and processes that have to do with the erasing indigenous people. So our presence on land continues to threaten indigenous land theft and therefore indigenous presence needs to be erased, which ultimately results in the disruption to our systems of uh, collective capacities. And these are systems of relationships, um, social, political, economic, and so on relationships and relationships that we have with our own ecosystems that are put in place specifically to ensure that we can survive and that we can th thrive. So today we're going to be talking about those relationships. Um, before we do that, we can go ahead and um, glance at the findings in the 21 interviews. Um, when I said, what are the reasons for suicide? People talked about our history and, and relationships within education governance, religion, economic systems, and food systems. They, they talked about the unequal distribution of power that our people experience every single day in all of these areas, as well as in um, the unequal distribution of power that we have in relation to our own land, and uh, including things such as land ownership. Now, they didn't say, for example, that um, John Smith died by suicide because he lost his relationship to the land. What they said is in order to understand suicidal behavior in our communities, understand how this unequal distribution of power has impacted and continues to impact our everyday lives today. So when we look at this and we see 21 out of 21 people talked about the impact of the ed education institution and how that impact continues to uh, inform our lives today, they're referring to the residential boarding schools in Canada, which across approximately 100 years, over 100,000 children were taken from our family homes for the purpose of assimilation. Here in the United States, this is the same as the, or very similar processes as the boarding school system. We can also see, for example, that people talked about the imposition of religion and the unequal distribution of power related to our economic systems and how those economic systems have been fractured in such a way that our own trade systems and our own systems of surviving and thriving have been infringed upon. So to give you an example of um, how we coded this, take a look here at Kyle. Kyle at the time was 60 years old. Um, I asked Kyle, why do you think our, our young people are losing their way? And Kyle thought about it for a second and he said, when the kids were taken away, they'd probably be four years old. You don't get them back until they're 18, 19. So you never get them back through their learning years. By the time you get them back, they've been raped, they've been beat, and they've been hurt so badly, they have no self-esteem anymore. The only answer is to hope that God does have mercy and let me kill myself. You drink to erase the bad memories. Today, it's no different. When you watch children in school, you see a little Indian boy go running by. 
the teacher lays the eagle claw grip on the shoulder and says, no running around, slams him up against the wall, nose against the wall. Little white boy goes running by doing the same thing, doesn't even notice the little white boy. So we are still treated like prisoners of the ward today. So what Kyle is talking about is that uh, history, the colonial history of residential schooling in Canada. He's saying that when the children were taken away, they'd probably be four years old and you don't get them back through their learning years um, until they're 18 or 19. So here Kyle is identifying the importance of both early childhood and adolescent experiences on human development. He says, by the time you get them back, they've been raped, beat and hurt so badly. Our uh, ancestors and elders have gone through a significant significantly traumatic experience during education and when you think about um, the interpersonal theory of suicide for example and how somebody might feel like they're uh, losing a sense of belongingness or purpose you can see that this experience has impacted hundreds of thousands of children and multiple generations and um, probably all of our families um, and then he goes on to say that he that he hopes God does have mercy to and let me kill myself. And there he's directly linking it to suicide and also alcohol use disorder. He then goes on to compare an example of an Indian boy with a white boy in school. And Kyle didn't go to residential boarding school and he's also not a white child. Um, and also white children didn't, didn't go to residential boarding school either. So for him to narrate this example um, in the way that he did with the pain that he felt about the inequity experienced by the little Indian child in the classroom means that this uh, site of education is a source of trauma for Kyle and he's re-traumatized every single time that a young Indian child is treated inequitably in classrooms. Um, he goes on to say that we are prisoners of war today and by definition a prisoner of war is someone who's held against their will during a time of wartime. And for him, he's explaining how this um, education system continues to treat us like prisoners of war. So as he narrates his example, these discriminatory practices become the compounding site for accumulating historical and intergenerational trauma. So this, for me, is, is an exact um, example of how that historical and intergenerational trauma impacts our people because remember Kyle himself didn't go to the residential boarding school and neither did white children yet Kyle still continues to feel this pain every time he feels some kind of in some kind of inequity So as demonstrated by members of the Cowichan community, our systems of relationality serve as protective mechanisms against feelings of loneliness or lack of purpose. Imagine that your systems of relationality are threatened by land theft, environmental contamination, boarding schools and state-run education, and colonial gender violence. Imagine that your land holds the bones of your ancestors, and therefore your senses of identity and belonging are closely related to your, related to that. Imagine your vulnerability to injury, disease, mental stress, food insecurity, and water insecurity because of that land domination. Imagine that your child is taken away from you, threatening your sense of self-determination, your ability to educate, teach, or pass along important cultural knowledge about their development. Imagine that you're being taken from your parents at a young age. Now imagine trying to navigate the world without these important early childhood attachments, cultural teachings, and practices. Imagine being this parent or this child trying to find a sense of belonging or purpose. Imagine being too depressed or anxiety ridden from being erased from US society, removed from your language and homeland and targeted with unfair stereotypes about who you are as a person. Or even worse, imagine that you experience physical or sexual violence because of it. Imagine that you're a young male who was once honored and revered as a provider and protector of your community. Imagine trying to provide and protect in a context where native people are incarcerated at a rate 38% higher than the national average or experience the highest rates of unemployment. Imagine the ongoing colonial gender violence that is evidenced every single time your gender is not represented in studies like this.
So indigenous peoples in Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand all contend with settler colonialism. At its core, settler colonialism is about settler acquisition of indigenous land and adaptation to indigenous land for the purpose of building their own homeland. You can see on the right hand side that colonial encroachment on our indigenous territories enables settlers to adapt to the land, but in the exact same process disrupts our indigenous collective capacities through a system of unequal power relationships which impede our self-determination. If we take a look at the left-hand side, all of the circles um, refer to or provide examples of indigenous collective capacities. That is these systems of relationships in the areas of culture and language, education, child welfare, governance, land, religion, spirituality, food systems and shelter, ec economics and trade and health systems and family. All of these different systems of relationships are put in place to ensure that we're able to make decisions for ourselves. And when we can make decisions for ourselves, we are then also able to adapt to wide scale change, change such as colonization, change such as a global pandemic. With the ability to decide for ourselves and make decisions and the ability to adapt, our possible futures are opened up. But when those relationships are impacted or infringed upon, and without that adaptive capacity, our possible futures are foreclosed or at least made very, very difficult. Oops. So let's take a look at this and imagine something else. What if you were raised in a community with elders and others who could teach you important cultural practices ethical and moral responsibilities and the language needed to put it all together? What if your entire sense of self was cultivated by family and social relationships? What if you could self-determine how you, your children, and your community responded to wide-scale change? What if you could protect your land and therefore your futures? What if colonialism didn't impede on the systems of relationships needed to thrive? And what if we talked about and engaged in life and learned what it means to live? So I want to turn now for us turn now and have us think about indigenous systems of relationality for indigenous people all around the world our systems of relationality include our plant and animal nations our natural world relations our ancestors in the spirit world. And it's these systems of relationships that have and will continue to sustain us as indigenous people. My ancestors accumulated networks of meaningful deep fluid intimate collective and individual relationships of trust. In times of hardship, we did not rely to any great degree on accumulated capital or individualism, but on the strength of relationships with others. So here on the bottom are some pictures that are meaningful to me about my plants, animals, my natural world and ancestral relations. The mountain is Mount Swakis, Mount Provo, that um, our people descended from after the Great Flood. And on the far right is my great grandfather, Abraham Johnny. So if we think about these systems of relationships and we think about what we have learned from Cowichan people, um, let me just uh, go to the next slide here, excuse me. Um, we think about that people shared with me their stories about divorce, their stories about the loss of children, substance use and mental health issues. And these are common explanations, individual level explanations for suicide. But in addition to this, folks shared stories of how colonization has impacted and continues to impact their life. They talked about how the legacy of residential schooling can still be felt today through fractured family relations and substance use. They discussed their belief that the Cowich and Chief and Council governance structure doesn't serve the needs of all members equally. Some told me stories about how young adults don't even know where their next meal is going to come from. Others told me how colonization has a bit impacted our ability to hunt and fish and harvest for food and sustenance and medicine. They also talked about how many of our cultural practices have changed or been impinged upon. And what these stories told me was that in order to understand suicide in our communities, we need to think about not just individual level factors, but also we need to consider collective level factors such as colonization. Cowichan taught me that we need to think about suicide not only on an individual level, but in relationship to multiple historical, social, cultural, and political factors. Because as human beings, 
none of us exist in isolation. We all exist within a network of a uh, vast system of social relationships. And for us as indigenous people, that often means relationships with plants, animals, natural world, and ancestors, and other um, cultural practices that are meant to sustain us and that are put in place specifically to sustain us. So now I want to move toward um, sharing with you some stories, um, some stories, and from these stories, I think that there are some teachings embedded, and certainly for me, there have been. Um, so in the spring of 2014, there were four additional deaths by suicide on Vancouver Island. Now, these were not all Cowichan members, um, but because of the close-knit nature of the tribal communities on Vancouver Island, pretty much everybody in the community was impacted in some way. I found out about this because people were posting things on Facebook, like keep your children close or honor your relations every single day. I started crying because I needed to be home with my family, with my community so that I can help in any way that I could. I felt like I couldn't go home because I was still in school. I had school work to finish. I didn't have any money or uh, anything to offer. And at that point, I wasn't even a mental health counselor. So I felt like I, how could I possibly help? My doctoral advisor said to me um, during this, she said, but this is your work. This is where you belong. And this is what you're supposed to be doing. Go home and be with your community. So I did. And I spent about eight weeks in couch and doing what I could to help the community heal from trauma and heal from that cycle of loneliness. Because at that point, I had been studying suicide for a couple of years. But remember, I was feeling scared. How could I possibly help? I didn't have any money. I didn't have any degrees. I shared this with my mom, and I told her that I was afraid of doing more harm than good. And she looked at me like First Nations elders do when they know that you know the answer. And she said to me, we sit and we eat together. And I thought, oh, my goodness. You know what? I can do that. And I remembered all of the times that our families had family dinners. We've had been having them for as long as I could possibly recall. I remember growing up um, helping to cook in the big house and at other ceremonial events. And I thought about what it means to eat together. And as we're sitting and we're eating together, we're being present with each other. We're asking about each other's day. We're telling each other that we care about each other and that we, I love you and that you do belong and that you do have a purpose. That presence, um, that presence um, we are reminded that trauma heals in the presence of caring others. And then, of course, culturally, we think about our cultural practices and beliefs around food, that whatever feelings are, that you're feeling when you're making and preparing the food for other people are the feelings that they're going to be ingesting. So if you're happy and, and you're um, grateful and you're excited about offering this food, um, so too will your, um, will your family and loved ones ingest that. Um, but on the other hand, if you're not feeling good, they'll do that too. So what was so what my mom was sharing when my mom said we sit and eat together, she was reminding me of all of this. She was reminding me um, of a time that our community would always visit daily with each other and that there would always be a, a pot of coffee on and um, scow bread to offer whomever stopped by. And, and most importantly, she was reminding me that trauma heals in the presence of caring others. So when I was home during that time period, one morning, my uncle Eric knocked on the door at five o'clock in the morning and he said, Stephen died this morning. He died from a stroke. And as soon as we heard this news, we began gathering all of the things that we thought the family might need. We knew that when someone dies, all the people in the community begin stopping by to pay their respects. I went to the family home and I started cooking. I knew that I could help by preparing food for the family and the guests. I knew that the family wouldn't be thinking about what they were going to be eating. I made easy things that I had known to make like hard boiled eggs and mush and toast and coffee. And after breakfast, they called me into the living room and they put a blanket on me. And they said, we'd be honored if you could cook for us for the remainder of the four days here. And they told me that they would need um, breakfast, lunch and dinner at 6 a.m. at noon and again at 5 p.m. for about 25 to 40 people. And when you're, when you're asked in this way from a family to step up and help? The answer is, of course, I would be honored to do that. And yet at the same time, my mind was racing because I don't cook. I'm, I don't cook. My husband is our family cook. And so immediately I thought, I'm going to have to get my husband to come and 
help me because how am I possibly going to do this? Well, it turns out that I do know how to cook to some degree and that I also know how to delegate tasks. But now that I've had a chance to reflect on this story, they wouldn't have asked my husband Michael to cook for them. So why do you think they asked me? I learned the answer throughout my time there. You see, they didn't ask me to cook because I was a good cook. I certainly was not. They asked me to cook because I knew our cultural protocols around funerals and around food. I knew how to hold the space that the family needed. And the most important task that I had that week was to be present for the family during their greatest time of need. And the most beautiful thing that I learned that week is that the solutions to any of our predicaments faced by our communities are already within our communities, our practices, and our ceremonies. From our ancestors, our communities, and our practices, we learn that trauma heals in the presence of caring others. So this next story that I wanna share is a story about Tahlequah. Did you, did you all hear about Tahlequah, the Orca mother who carried her, the body of her dead baby for 17 days in the Puget Sound in Washington State in 2018? The baby calf died a few hours after birth our orca relations are malnourished and in dire need of food and protection. Noise, noise from vessels interrupts their ability to find food. The dams that we have put up have prevented the salmon from running. The ocean is polluted. They're trying to lay down the Keystone Pipeline right in the orca's traditional territory. None of the orca babies born in the Salish Sea in the past few years have survived. And as a result, the species is at risk for extinction. In what newspapers have called it a journey of love, Tahlequah clung to her baby diving deeply to retrieve the calf each time it slid from her head. She only let her calf go for a few minutes at a time to go get food. And when she wasn't holding up her calf, another member of her community was. A few hours after her baby died, someone reported seeing Tahlequah with about six other female orcas gathered at the mouth of a, of a cove in a tight knit circle. Tahlequah was not alone. Tahlequah's behavior was also not unusual. Orcas, dolphins, and other mammals, including gorillas, are known to carry their deceased young in what is widely understood by scientists to be an expression of grief. Orcas have strong social bonds with their relations and their relationships drive much of their behavior. I want us to think about her grieving process and what we can learn from her about what it means to begin healing. What do you think Talakwa was trying to tell us? I do know that she reminded us and her community reminded us that trauma heals in the presence of caring others. So study after study shows us that having a good support network is the most powerful protection against becoming traumatized. In order to recover, mind, body, and brain need to be convinced that it's safe to let go. Relationships provide us with physical and emotional safety, including the safety from being ashamed or judged, and to strengthen our courage to tolerate, face, and process what has happened. If people have a grief and it's not grieved, it'll affect the next generation. It just keeps on reverberating. Once grief is expressed, you can begin healing from it. When we build our support network, we identify relationships that can help us recover, feel physically and emotionally safe, feel heard. And it's this support network, um, including the support network from our plant and animal relations, from, our, um, from each other, from our cultural practices. It's this support network that will provide us with the security and safety that we need in order to heal um, on our own. So when I began thinking about, but what do we do, right? How do we get through this? If, if we have to look, if we have to, um, you know, think about our own survival in this particular time, um, how can we strengthen our physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual well-being? And so I asked folks in my own social network on Facebook and folks brilliantly came up with some ideas for us. So in terms of physical and intellectual health, suggestions for everyday practice, people tell me that they're exercising, like walking, running, hiking, swimming, lifting weights, and doing body weight exercises. There's, we're strengthening our relationships to and connections to our mountains, our land, our water, our plant and animal relations. People right now are doing a lot of harvesting and gardening, bird watching. Focusing on eating healthy, cooking for others, and having vitamins and supplements. Some folks are training for the revolution, making a bow and arrow, or participating in martial arts. And other folks are knitting and crocheting and weaving and doing other making activities. And of course, it's always important to sleep well. I've divided these into these categories, but we can also see that some of these things fit in multiple categories. 
Um, so keep an eye on that as we go through. In terms of our intellectual health, this is the health of both individuals and of communities. Uh, folks are researching and learning to make informed decisions. And I just realized you guys didn't get to see this beautiful slide. Um, they're reading and listening to books. They're participating in social and civic life. They're acquiring additional training, professional development, or new skills. Folks are learning their ancestral language and writing poetry. And if we go ahead and move on to emotional and spiritual well-being and think and thoughts related to that, um, in terms of emotional health, people are FaceTiming and video chatting with loved ones or visiting with family or pets inside their home. They're crying and they're laughing and remembering that tears and tears are cleansing. Um, we're allowing ourselves to grieve and walk through sadness and loss. We're continuing our own healing journeys and we're working with mental health counselors. We're holding ourselves with compassion and sometimes that means lowering our standards or delegating tasks or asking for help when you need it. We're adhering to a schedule. We're singing, dancing, drumming, and other cultural practices. We're writing letters and emails to loved ones or just writing and journaling on its own. We're playing board games and completing puzzles. We're setting boundaries with ourselves and others, and we're taking a break when we need it, especially from news or social media. And in terms of spiritual health, folks are engaging in prayer, mindfulness, meditation, breathing, and cultivating gratitude. They're learning how to process or weave nettle, cedar, and other cultural practices. They're reconnecting to our land, Mother Earth. They're honoring loved ones that have crossed over and sometimes retracing the steps of our ancestors. It's helpful to know that some of the um, hunting, fishing, harvesting, gathering, or walking in the same lands as our ancestors um, helps us with that intergenerational connection. They're reclaiming indigeneity. They're giving to others who need it and they're participating in activism and remembering that movement, that we're always in movement. And when we're always in movement and always in flux, that also means that those feelings of loneliness and belonging that we were talking about earlier are also in movement and flux so that they will, they too will pass. They're bathing in the forest or the mountains and they're thinking about what it means for them to restore healthy intergenerational relationships. So now I wanna provide some thoughts or directions forward in terms of um, individuals, families and communities, professional caregivers, practitioners, researchers um, and then on the next slide we will think about schools and tribal leadership as well as policymakers. so here individuals and families here are just a couple of suggestions if you're concerned about um, somebody in your life for example you might you, you want to check in regularly with them through text email social media phone or in person in terms of the actual suicide literature caring text messages and caring letters is the only intervention where you um, this is where you send an e a text message or a, a letter to a person who's at risk for these feelings of loneliness and sadness. And that regular check-in is the only intervention known to reduce death by suicide that we know of so far. Um, so always making sure that you check in and not just after a traumatic event, um, but checking in regularly with people that you're concerned about. Think about in your as an individual family or community what it means to strengthen and restore relationships to plants animals natural world and ancestral relations think about what it means to engage in indigenous land restoration practices and um, think about what it means for you in your experience um, to consider what it means to uh, and to understand that trauma heals in the presence of caring others as professional caregivers, practitioners, and researchers, we want to think about centering land-based and community-based approaches and indigenous approaches to overall health care. So for example, what does it mean to belong or be from a specific place? What does it mean to develop or design um, focus groups or uh, healing workshops or anything else with an eye towards intergenerational and collective knowledge? Um, family-based and group-based, hands-on and interactive. So these are essentially um, encouraging us to consider indigenous teaching and healing practices such as oral storytelling, um, indigenous social structures such as intergenerational, collective or family-based because we recognize that, our, that, first of all, we don't exist in isolation, but so many people told me about their loved one going off to a, for example, a substance use um, program and they would come and that was off off of the island so when they would come back 30 days later they probably were successful in their program but being immersed into the same everyday social structures and practices in the community um, often led to a relapse for them 
and people would think, oh, well, it's just because their friends are bad influences. But the truth is we don't exist in isolation. So when we're trying to do mental health therapy or um, trying to mitigate suicide, for example, our approaches also need to consider intergenerational and collective approaches. So if we're looking at now schools and tribal um, governments, um, we know that black, indigenous, and other people of color at high, at, are at the highest risk for viral infection. So I'm interested in um, thinking about and asking the question, is opening schools the right thing to do? Because we do know that if we open schools and uh, the global pandemic has another loss of 100,000 elders, we know that they will likely be black or indigenous elders. Um, and other things that we can think about, protecting and encouraging indigenous language and curriculum, organizing projects that strengthen indigenous self-determination and strengthen our healthy relationships to land and language and culture. If we're policy, if we have policymakers and, and other leadership um, on, on the call, we want to think about funding land-based and indigenous approaches to health. We want to think about protecting indigenous sovereignty and land. Um, we want to think about returning land to indigenous communities. We want to recover and protect place names. We want to consider who's at the table, whose perspective is being accounted for, who has decision-making power on whose behalf. And we also want to engage as communities and as policymakers and leadership in claiming and re reclaiming rights and entitlements. So overall, Cowichan taught us that we need to think about suicide not only on an individual level, but also in relation to multiple historical, cultural, and political factors. When we consider Indigenous systems of relationality, we also illuminate potential protective factors. My mom shared that in order to address suicide, we sit and we eat together. Our cultural practices and ceremonies remind me that the solutions to any of our predicaments are already within our communities, our practices, and our ceremonies. We learn from Tahlequah that every grieving process is different and that trauma heals in the presence of caring others and that it's okay to grieve. And collectively, these lessons remind us that we need to intentionally and purposefully cultivate our support network using Indigenous systems of relationality. And while each individual must have the skills and knowledge to ensure their own safety, survival, and prosperity in both the physical and spiritual realm, their existence is ultimately dependent upon intimate relationships of reciprocity, humility, honesty, and respect with all elements of creation, including plants and animals. So as we wrap up today, and we're thinking about our systems of indigenous relationality, I want us to remember that we are ancestors to our future generations. And when they ask, how did our ancestors survive the global pandemic? Or how did they survive colonization? What do we want them to know about our resistance and our survival? And I ask uh, each and every one of you to share some of these stories with people who you think it might help. I also give thanks to Stuart Pegabong of Cowichan who gifted me with this uh, logo. It's an eagle and a salmon. The eagle for us represents our connection to our ancestral and spirit worlds, as well as our connection to our possible futures. And the salmon for us, along with the life cycle of the salmon represents uh, life stages and, and the knowledge that's being transmitted across the different life stages. So, um, to each and every one of you, Haichka Siam Natsiaya, Tlam Utsia Tala, Ni Alkmitst Ah Tanakwail, Yath Ut Hakwashtha, Natsa Machkwalawin, Haichapka. Thank you all so much for having me today. Thank you. That was uh, a fabulous, wonderful, very moving uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, I think we're at the, the uh, stop sharing. Uh, we have a little bit of time. Uh, do you have some time to take some questions? I do, I'd be happy to, thank you. Okay, uh, I guess one thing uh, that I would follow up on is, is just, uh, uh, and then Shoshone has some questions is, you know, I, the, around relationality and around uh, doing uh, uh, implementing interventions that are outside of the box that are more consistent with our uh, indigenous ways of being uh, 
And so I'm wondering if you can unpack a little bit. And we talked yesterday about, you know, the nature walks and assessments. And for those of the that are mental health professionals or people working within the system, how to think uh, differently, uh, if you can unpack that a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what I the first thing that I do when I'm thinking about how to respond to the needs of the community, first of all, is to draw out or engage the community in thinking about the values or design commitments that you would make in order to design the project itself or the programming itself. So in my case, when I talked to Indigenous elders, I was interested in designing a Indigenous biopsychosocial assessment. Now, this is the typical assessment that a mental health practitioner would generally do on the first visit. It's often a couple of hours long with papers and clipboards asking somewhat and pretty invasive questions in a lot of cases. Um, things such as family history, physical history, mental health history, and so on, with the intention of providing some kind of a diagnosis about why that person is there. So what we did instead of that initial um, biopsychosocial assessment is we took young people out on a walk with a medicine person. And, and with the elders input, we had decided that we would design this entire project with the ideas of the importance of place, intergenerational transmission of knowledge, indigenous systems of relationality and collective approaches to understanding. Um, and so we asked, we asked young people to go out on a walk with a First Nations medicine person, and they were asked to gather or harvest items that represented each of their relationships. So they may have gathered, for example, a shell or a piece of bark or um, a pretty cedar bough, and they had to think about what each of these different artifacts represented, who, who and what each of these different artifacts represented. So as you can imagine, these young people talked about their um, soccer teams, their coaches, their friends, um, plants, animals, the natural world, their ancestors, folks that they had lost. And from there, we asked them to take these artifacts and create an art project representation. So I actually imagined that it would be some kind of a hanging art project, like a hanging art mobile of some sort, but they came up with much more beautiful interpretations. And, and from there, I asked them as a social worker using a narrative therapy approach, tell me the story about this. And so whatever their art project is, they could tell me the story that the shell represents their mom, the cedar bough represents their uh, ancestors, for example, the fern represents their um, plant relations. So these young folks had pretty sophisticated understandings and stories related to each of their different artifacts. And through those stories, I was able to glean information about their mental, physical, social um, health and predicaments. And I was able to conduct a biopsychosocial assessment using this particular process as, as an approach. Um, instead of the clipboard thing. And as you can imagine, we developed through that process different um, kinds of uh, relationships with each other. So I wasn't necessarily a mental health practitioner or even a researcher. It, I was more like auntie to all of these young people who were participating in the study. And I participated as well. So they were able to see me engage in these uh, indigenous teaching and learning practices, such as the use of metaphor, um, hands-on learning, intergenerational learning. We had about 25 participants on the nature walk. Um, with the eldest being an indigenous elder and the youngest being two years old. So just thinking about how we might design our different projects using our own value systems and our own commitments, I think is a good step in the right direction. And the way that I begin thinking about some of these things is just to ask, like, for example, the biopsychosocial assessment is an assessment. So if I ask myself, how is it that our ancestors assessed our young people 100 years ago or 200 years ago? and the truth is they would do it in community. They would do it through everyday experience. They, they, they continue to assess us today based on our participation in cultural and, and uh, community events. And whether we know it or not, they are watching us and so too are our ancestors. So, there, so if you think about that, um, then I began thinking about, so what does this mean then to do a uh, physical, social and developmental assessment on young people and how can we do that in sort of an everyday situation? Thank you. That was uh, well said. And it just reminds me of this sort of uh, governmentality, sort of Michelle Foucault of how often in our own communities, whether indigenous or non-indigenous, but even if we're trained in institutions, we have to deconstruct and sort of decolonize because we can be an instrument of colonization if we don't. 
right? That we have to question and, and critique the existing paradigms and, and uh, systems and interventions such as an assessment, like, you know, and not take it for granted that this is the way to do an assessment within our communities. Because if we don't do that, then we can risk just being a uh, tool of the, the colonial sort of system. Yeah, and I think that when we kind of push back and, and think like, how, how have we always been doing this? Because we have, right? It's our ancestors and elders are always looking out for our health and our well being and so on. So, what is it that they're doing? And it's through observation, it's through story, it's through our own uh, teaching and learning practices. And I think it's our responsibility. Um, because we're those folks who are participating in those institutions as well, right? We're participating mm -hmm. in Indigenous erasure and um, by participating in those institutions. So we need to ask ourselves when it comes to decolonizing, what are we willing to give up, right? Because to some degree, we have those privileges that are holding us in our particular places too. And we have to think about as, um, well, predominantly, I, I would say white folks should be thinking about that, but also as brown and black folks, what are we willing to, what kinds of pr privileges and uh, comforts are we willing to give up in order to make sure that our people can have something returned back to them? Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. Shoshone, I know you had a, a follow-up. Yeah, I did. And I just want to um, start off by just thanking you for your presentation and your your contributions to um, the, this field. Um, what I appreciate um, in reading some of your work is how multidimensional it is and not focusing on just one particular aspect of suicidality, but just that, that comprehensive um, approach to um, assessment and treatment. Um, and I think that in our model here at Two Feathers, that that's something that we've, we have incorporated in, in several different areas, but um, to see your work put it together in a very cohesive um, way is um, very beneficial. Um, in our ACORN program, I know that in your um, research, you had an elders consultation group and then in our um, ACORN program here, um, there was a similar process in consulting the elders to, um, to identify some of those key components to um, programming and starting off with mentorship as um, a, a way to prevent and instill some of those um, guided participation components in there. And so I'm really curious um, if you could talk a little bit more about the importance of the guided meditation and then also um, talking about youth voice because that was another component um, that you included that I think is very important. Yeah, thank you. So you said the first part was about uh, guided meditation? No, guided participation, sorry. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so when we had the focus group with the elders, our intention was to glean from our elders a value, a, a set of values, if you will, about what it means to be that's Cowichan, a person from the warm land. And what we wanted from there is our, our they told me things, um, like I, I asked the broad question of what does it mean to walk in a good way? What does it mean to be Cowichan? And that, that was the entire conversation. And they told me things like, we are people who belong to this particular place with a responsibility to this place and with a responsibility to all of our relations. And essentially they were talking about uh, pretty wide, widely known Cowichan teachings that then were, we were then able to use those as the cornerstones of every decision-making process we had in the development of our project itself. So if, you, if we were developing a focus group, but if you're developing say a workshop or a um, group therapy intervention of some sort that you want to do, um, you would begin with that. And, and some folks call these um, design conjectures, other folks call it design or guiding commitments. Um, I know Gregory Cajete calls them guiding commitments. So what are, what are the commitments that will guide our process? And for us in Cowichan, it was place-based relationality, intergenerational and collective and also engaging indigenous teaching and learning practices. So every step of the way we said, okay, so if this is going to be, if we're going to put priority on being place-based, 
what does that look like? If we're going to put priority on intergenerational or collective, who do we need to be inviting to the table? Um, who do we need to be inviting to the table to design this in the first place? Which is also related to youth. Um, so I, I ask youth, what are we? What do we? What do you wish the adults in your life knew? What What do we? What we? What do we need to know in order to serve you better? And every single one of them, and there was only five young people that I had actually mic'd up for this particular interview, but every single one of them said, you need to know that we actually have something important to share, that we're not just leaders of your future, that we're more than that. We have something to share now. Um, one young person, and rest in peace, shared with me that um, she had overheard an elder at a conference talking about they, they had a young person give a political type talk or an inspirational, political, motivational talk of some sort. And she had overheard the elder um, or at least older person to her. Um, so it was, I don't know who, how old the person was, but she had overheard some older person being surprised and um, really surprised that this young person was articulate and participating in politics and that sort of thing. And she was deeply offended by, by that comment because um, our young people have something to say today, and they don't want to just be there at meeting number one or be there in the corner singing a, a hand drum song or something. They really want to be there sitting at the table making decisions for how their, how these, this programming and this mental health approaches and these education approaches will actually impact our everyday lives because they're the ones who know best about their own predicaments. Um, so that's what they shared with me is even when we, you know, when we say things like I've said in the past, like, there are leaders of the future. And that almost relegates them to something that's going to be coming, like they're gonna be important later on, but right now we've got work to do. But what happened to the work that we have to do with the children and young people that are present? It's the same kind of thing in education, right? We have a lot of work to do because when we sit in our education meetings, we're always talking about children and not with them. They're not the ones that are generally designing our programming or our practices. I think so, that's you. such an important, yeah, I think that's such an important concept because when we're talking about culture and we're talking about um, our youth, it, a part of it is that um, connection with the elders and then part of it is, is that we're a living culture and so they have something to contribute by the mere fact that they're our youth and they're just who they are so being able to connect them to the culture but to also give them that place of um providing us um what they do have to contribute right now i think is really important um, and providing that space um for them to um feel like they belong and that they can contribute to that process here and now i think is very important and um i just want to i think i would um, I also just wanted to follow up with that about um, healing and regenerating intergenerational relationships because a lot of elders told me that the young people aren't ready to hear or to sit patiently or respectfully with, with their knowledge and the young people told me that the elders don't want to share that. Um, but so there's something there in the disconnect between the communication across generations that at least in Cowichan we need to think about and address. Um, so when you're thinking about it, how is it that we heal those relationships? Because we have elders in our communities who, who have been directly impacted by the residential schooling system and who, and we have young people and other folks in our communities who maybe don't know what it means to be a parent because they didn't have that when they were younger. And maybe they don't know what it means to be a, a person in a indigenous system of trades and, and uh, reciprocal relations with other people in the community, for example. Maybe that's not something that they grew up with because of that um, impact of the residential and boarding school systems. So I think when we're also thinking about designing these as intergenerational projects, for example, we want to also think about what it means to heal some of those relationships across generations too. Yes, very important. So thank you for for um, speaking to that. Um, I did wanna follow up by asking you um, specifically one of the questions that you asked um, the elders in your research, which is what does it mean to walk in a good way? You want me to ask that? Or you want me to answer? <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> Better than me. Um, <laughs> maybe this means to, at the end of this life, um, you know, when, when our time here on earth is done, 
we, we hear all these stories and for those of us who have been with somebody who transitions over, they're not asking for their degrees. They're not asking for their Rolex watches or their Teslas or anything else. What they're asking for are their relationships and the people that mean the most to them. And so what matters most to us, I think on life in here in, on life is did we love well? Did we love well? And is that, you know, because if we did, that means that we cultivated a system of responsible and, and social relationships that were meaningful also to other people. And if we can do that, that that to me is mean is what it means to walk in a good way. And for me, that includes um, did we love well our plants, our animals, our natural world relations, our ancestors? Are we continuing to take on what it means for us as Indigenous people to heal in order to heal for our ancestors as well, in order to not pass on some of that trauma to our young people? Um, and, and are we engaging in that responsibility? And if the answer is yes, and we're doing our very best to love others and uh, those systems of relationships well, then I think we're probably walking in a good way. You know, as a follow-up to that, uh, you know, one of the things when we first started the speaker series, we would ask, and we haven't did it so much lately, we would ask uh, our presenters, speakers, uh, what it means to be Indigenous, if there was one word to describe what it means to be Indigenous. There was varied answers, and so uh, is what that mean for you, uh, this idea of relationality? Uh, or is it is it more than that uh, to be you know indigenous you know uh, and I think it's an important like political question that we're not a racial ethnic identity, uh, but uh, what does it mean to be indigenous uh, for you? Yeah, thank you for that. That's an important question. Today it means to live in good relations with the land, and it means and and associated with that is also to live in good relations with all others. That's that's the short answer but I wrote a dissertation on it, so we could be here all day. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was, I was, I wanted to uh, give a good follow-up to that because, you know, we've got uh, uh, many different, they're similar, but many different answers to that question. Uh, I yeah. guess. Code it and write a little paper about it. Yep, uh, it'd be a good research project. Uh, uh, we've had a, some really uh, great speakers on here, like yourself. Uh, so I guess one last question is, I'm curious of this uh, possible selves, you know, Stephanie Freiberg has done a fair, uh, you know, a big part of her initial research was on possible selves. And is that, how does that uh, play into or are part of your ongoing research, uh, uh, you know, you know, within the dissertation? Yes. But what are your thoughts around that uh, because you know we do a lot of work at you uh, with youth at Two Feathers, and you know I'm a, a big believer in that idea of possible self, such as such as uh, having Native uh, people like Shoshone, like myself, showing the way, uh, having uh, college Native local mentors, uh, and so uh, I just wanted to see if you had some thoughts uh, about and, and really about how it's integrated in. Uh, your own work, your own research? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so just to connect it a little bit back to um, suicide among Indigenous people or just suicide in general, um, Michael Chandler out of UBC in Canada, in British Columbia, conducted some work about um, young people and their possible selves. And what he found was that 85% of those folks who were actively suicidal, as in in uh, a mental health or hospital facility at the actual time that they were working with these young people, 85% of actively suicidal young people were not able to connect to their own possible future. Now, that doesn't mean that if you can't connect to your possible future self, then you must be suicidal. It's not like that at all, um, but more so, we, I mean, we don't exactly know what that means, but th but that there was some sort of a foreclosing in their um, active emotional space where they weren't actually able to connect to that possible future. And what we mean by that is like, what are you gonna be doing in five minutes, in five years, in 30 years? Are you able to come up with um, some sort of an imagination of what your future might look like? And for me, that means that we as indigenous people do have to cultivate and open up those spaces for to um, open up those possibilities for certain possible futures. And if you think about yourself and even something like education, at some point in your life, there was some kind of an experience that you had that said, wow, 
this is a possibility. It's a real legitimate possibility for you to go on to graduate school and become a clinical psychologist, for example. And maybe you've seen or heard, but um, if we design our programming, our projects, our practices, and our, any approach that we have with, if we're designing it with particular things in mind, such as indigenous systems of relationality, all of a sudden that opens up all the different kinds of possible futures for the people that we're working with. So indigenous systems of relationality, for example, if you're designing intentionally with that in mind, you are opening up possibilities for people to um, have relationships that can sustain them. And we know that it's those relationships and those feelings of safety, emotional safety essentially in those relationships that allow us to um, begin our own healing process. Um, so I think that they, it, it, so I think in summary, they can, we can design programming and projects to open up those possible futures, and we can identify the things that are limiting or foreclosing those possible futures. Um, in just one small example, and this is from some of uh, Dr. Freiberg's work, is that if you just jump on Google right now and type in American Indian and take a look at the top 100 uh, images that are there, you'll see that the images are relegated to 18th and 19th century representations. So indigenous people are relegated to the past, or if they're not relegated to the past and there's a contemporary image, you'll see that it's like somebody at a, you know, some dance party or something with a headdress on and some sort of cultural appropriation. Um, now, if you do the same thing with African American or Asian American, for example, you'll see contemporary representations. And these, these representations for are parts of what it foreclose indigenous possible futures and participate and are, are things that participate in indigenous erasure. Um, so there's lots of things that we can think about, like what are foreclosing our possible futures and eliminate those things, but what are opening up our possible futures? And for me, that means strengthening our systems of relationships so that we have access to the things that are meant to make sure that we thrive as individuals and communities. And that makes a lot of sense that uh, sort of furthered my, uh, I just have always resonated with that uh, idea of possible selves. And, you know, I think one of the reasons why, you know, I got a doctor degree was because, you know, my father uh, started to change uh, some of the intergenerational cycles within own, my own community uh, and, uh, you know, as a, as a native man. And so uh, thank you for that. Uh, I was going to turn it over to uh, Shoshone to uh, have some final last words uh, and, uh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And and talking about such a um, important topic as um, suicidality today, I think that it's important to um, to remind the listeners out there and the people who joined us today how important connection is um, with. Um, the, the members of our community with people who may be struggling. If you know of somebody who might be in a difficult way or having a difficult time to reach out to them, that that's important. It does make a difference to let them know you care, to let them know that there are other people out there, professionals that can, um, that you can connect them with services um, here at Two Feathers or other agencies or hotlines that you can call like the National Suicide um, Awareness Hotline. Um, and uh, we have some pretty fabulous uh, resources, both professionally and um, personally within our communities that we can connect the people that we really love um, and cherish because those are the possible um, futures that really do make a difference. And so I would just encourage everyone to think about um, the people in your lives and people who may be struggling and how um, it really does make a difference to reach out to them in the time that they need that um, support. Thank you. And, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in. We see all the, the comments and questions. We'll, we will uh, respond. And I also want to uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Elliot Gross, for uh, your time. Uh, you know, we really appreciate it and for the, the the effort and and uh, you know really preparation that you put into your uh, presentation today, I think it was exactly what we were looking for and more. And 
And I want to uh, also let everybody know that, that we'll be continuing next week uh, with our speaker series. Uh, feel free to message us any feedback or anybody you'd like to see on here. And uh, I hope you all have a, uh, a good uh, three day weekend and uh, Two Feathers is out. Thank you all.